There we go. We are recording. Okay. All right. Okay, so welcome back to another episode of Laying on the Table, the Southern Board Gaming Cop. I do this every time. (laughs) Every stinking time. Welcome back to another edition of Lay It on the Table, the Southern Board Gaming Podcast that puts the accent on Southern. I am go. one of your hosts. Thank you. I finally got that right one of these days. I am one of your hosts, Joe Mahaffey, and it's a pleasure to be with you all today. Hi, James. How was your Labor Day? Because we took hey, that day Joe, off. Hey, Joe. It's good to be here. Um, yeah, no, Labor Day was good. Um, yeah. Got a lot of, oddly enough, got a lot of work done. I met, met up with friends, but, uh, you know, school is in session. So once the semester starts, it's uh, hard to get away from that. No, I, I totally understand. And it was funny because I was um, I was walking in the neighborhood yesterday because I'm trying to get back into the, the routine of, you know, doing healthy things. And I ran into a neighbor of mine and he goes, when are you going to drop the next podcast? And I'm like, well, we took a week off. I mean, Labor Day. So give us a break. So, no, yeah. So that was that was actually kind of gratifying. That is uh, gratifying. To know that people are paying attention. So thank you very much, uh, Jacoby. You know who you are. Um, anyway, How was your Labor Day? Did you get uh, time to go and do fun things with people and friends? And Yeah, we actually um, we went down to my mom's and huh. spent four hours with her. And it was a lot of... Let me replace this router for you, and let me change out your Alexa light bulbs, and let me. But it was a great time. We um, we got to spend a lot of time with her. We got to uh, just kind of take that whole Saturday and do that, and then we were able to game on, uh, you know, Sunday and Monday, and nice. Kind of. What did you get to the <laughs> table? Uh, what did we do? Oh gosh, what did we do on Labor Day? Uh, it was interesting. We actually played. Uh, was it? Labor Day, or was it the weekend after? I'm I'm actually drawing a blank as to what we did on uh, Labor Day. We might have just, uh, you know what? I think we had the girls home, and right. so I think we pulled out Carcassonne, maybe, or did we already talk about that? I honestly, it, that's a that's it's a, a that's a good one. Yeah, it's, it's I, you had talked about playing it uh, with Dale, but I don't think you. Yeah, topper game. So we had all four of them. I think they were home for a little bit because there were just different travel plans and stuff going on, and so uh, we kind of got to do that, which was kind of nice to to kind of have that. And I think Labor Day we just kind of, you know, we're just sort of chill. Um, good. I did actually. You know what? Labor Day, I went to the game store, and they didn't change their hours to say they were going to open up earlier because it was Labor Day, but the owner was in there with Shane from our D and D game and another couple from the store and they were playing Betrayal at House on the Hill third edition. And so, so I got to sit there and watch, because I came in late, and completely got the game, you know, and mm-hmm. just sort of the nuances. And so uh, the Saturday after that, we, Dale and I played it um, as a two person game, which basically meant I played the third person. I played ah, two characters. Okay. She played one. Uh, when the haunt happened, I became it was my character who became the haunt. So I let you know, I, I took on that role and said here. So we enjoyed it a lot. And then this is where it gets really interesting. Is the uh, next day we got uh, our daughter to play Betrayal at House on the Hill with us. Oh wow! How did and, that go? Uh, it was great. She she really um, you know embraced it. Uh, she was the haunt, and oh, nice. uh, she won. Wow! Yeah, okay. she she figured it out, and she well she won because I had a really lousy roll. <laughs> yeah, and, well, yeah. You know, so it, it's the, it, the so game is a bit it. chaotic, so yeah. don't uh, don't go looking for too much strategy there. But well, I think super we, fun. I think we might try to play it again uh, today because it's it's a it's a fun game and it's a game we can get her to play, and I think. I've even told her because she's. Th- I think her friends would like it. Mm-hmm. So I just told her, so you know, if you want to take the game and go to your friends, go do it. Six ah, player cool. game. Um, but what was interesting is you know there's so many pieces mm-hmm. to this game, and nobody has developed an organizer for third edition. Everything is second edition and legacy and all that other stuff, and right that, that's kind of annoying. But I have these little bitty teeny bags. 
mm-hmm. but I was able to finally get it all organized. So it's I can, I can get it on the table quickly and get it out. That's my thing. I, I like games if they're complex that I can get it out quickly. Yes. You know. Uh, we were meeting up with uh, friends from work yesterday at um, the Swamp Rabbit Cafe, which is just down the road yeah, from us. Yeah, sure. Yep, lovely little spot. And uh, it's all of us with, like, toddlers or slightly, you know, younger preschoolers or very, very young, young children. So a bunch of this. And uh, talking to the guy who's in the psych department. Mm. And he's like, oh, yeah, my wife and I just picked up Jaws the Lion. And it's just, it takes too long to set up. By the time I've got it set up, you know, she's like, well, time for bed. So, and I guess she is a chemistry researcher. So, yeah. But, that, I mean, well, yep. Yeah, having having things organized so that you can just pop it out and say, we're good to go in 10 minutes. Well, I've noticed more and more game designers are, are prioritizing that type of component, either with the mm-hmm. first release or like if they do a subsequent le- release. Like, for example, we've been waiting on um, the updated, re- the expansion of Tang Garden. And they have the big box oh, yeah. for Tang Garden. And they've layered it so that you can get the different modules out very quickly. Um, which is always, we love that game, but that's always been the challenge with that game is that there's so much to it that if you mm-hmm. don't have a functional way of quickly getting it on the table. Um, so I hope to see more and more of that. Because I think, you know, um, f- for Betrayal to be a ha- you know a, an Avalon Hill Hasbro kind of game, the insert's very, you know, crackly pra- plastic, but it's efficient. Yes. It is efficient if you can just get those little pieces sorted out in a, in a functional way. And so, anyway... And I think, you know, it's, I noticed it a lot with Kickstarters and then like parks came with a really nice sort of fun organized, uh, setup in there. Mm-hmm. And I'm looking forward to the, um, the wingspan box, the big box of wingspan yeah. that's coming out mm-hmm. with the Asia thing. But, you know, there's another sort of DIY thing that I used to do was build, um, my own organizers with a uh, foam core. Yeah. So I have this, yeah. an older game called uh, Caverna, one of Rosenberg's giant worker placement sort of things. Right. And that came with a million little pieces. And so I built um, an organizer out of, for myself for that, so that now it just comes out in three or four trays and yeah. away we go. Yeah. And that's the thing. I mean, uh, I don't know. I just kind of like it when somebody at Etsy's done it, work, done it for me. <laughs> Well, and I noticed that a bunch of uh, games, even that if they don't have particularly rigorous, shall we say, inserts, uh, they do come with uh, sets of baggies that are yeah. generally too big. But you know, it's still it's a nice gesture. No, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. But yeah, so that was betrayal um, this weekend. Uh, we I'd gotten just before I left town, um, the gardens showed up. Okay, and it was a Kickstarter I had backed, and it's your. You're, it's a drafting, uh, it's a card drafting setup where you are growing your portion of Sydney's Royal Botanical Garden. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, back in, oh gosh, 91 or 92, I got to go to Sydney for about three weeks in my hotel. I have like, to say that, that just a minute, I, I, I heard a name, a person's name, and I was like, oh, Sydney, oh, good to see you. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, I went to Sydney, Australia. Right, got it. Back it in the second, early yeah, yeah. '90s, and the hotel I stayed at was uh, just a few blocks from this botanical garden. So I've spent oh, nice. a lot of time in this garden. Well, I'll, I say a lot of time. A long time ago, I spent a long time in this garden. Uh, this was back when you actually had to find a payphone to call home. Um, oh, yeah, no yeah. cell phones, uh, or at least not cell phones that you could take with you personally yeah. Yeah, they were in a bag or something in my car um so anyway uh so this is this was kind of a fun game it was easy to learn it's okay. card drafting it's easy to score it, it kind of reminded me a little bit of um santa monica in the okay. way that your meeples work only there's not a there's not the plethora of meeples <laughs> that you can get in santa monica but it's that kind of a Easy to learn, easy to play, card drafting kind of vibe, and uh, you know we, we we did one playthrough of it yesterday, and we probably didn't score it right because we were kind of learning the nuances of that. But we're going to play it again today and see if uh, see if we get any better at it. 
from that. So are you laying out a tableau of a garden or is it set collection or what's the. Yeah. So, so they give you um, these two boards that you connect, you put side by side and then you put this middle piece on top of it that just sort of separates the left and the right side of the board. And in a Dale and I, so because it's a two player version, we have four rounds but we draft twice from each card deck. So there's an A deck, a B deck, and a C deck. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to fill out your tableau. Uh, and there's rules about, you know, you, can, you can't you can go to the same um, card deck tw twice in a row. Okay. So you build this out until you fill out your entire tableau. So you have 24 spots covered. Nice. And then as you're doing it, as you see certain trees, um, and as you cross certain streams and land at a fountain, you gain points. And okay. they, and the more you have those in your tableau, and you're and you're moving your meeple back and forth across that particular part of the park or the garden, you kind of get an engine of, of a point engine. And then at the end, um, oh, and there is also the there's if you put a bench in, you score the bench very similar to the way that you would score the abbot in Carcassonne, where uh. you circle around it you know like one two three four five mm -hmm. uh and then uh at the end you count up your statues your unique trees and um whoever has the most of a certain thing gets uh if you have more of this than somebody else you get 10 points so if you're in a four player game and player one has more than players one two and three they get 10 points if player two has less than one but more than the other two you know they get some points so it's, it's really interesting okay and yeah. you know the scoring is really is really rather balanced and that's kind of what we've we've sort of seen is we watched a play we didn't really watch a playthrough we watched a how to play okay yeah and uh and that really helped us kind of kickstart but the but the book was was super easy to follow uh and you know the the this getting it set up and getting it on the table we just kind of dove right in because it was you know it was one of those shrink wrapped on our shelves and we were like not for long so <laughs> do you remember the designer and or publisher yeah so the designer is uh matt or matthew dunston and brett gilbert uh okay. it's the publisher's grail games uh and the artist is carrie arkin it's a very it's a pretty it's a pretty um uh box it's got the the sydney opera house and it's got the bridge in the background and then they have the white ibis, which is the bird that is just evidently so famous for down there. But but they just, I mean, you know, the the Kickstarter just arrived Monday. Oh wow! So a week ago Monday. So it's they've just got their um, their you know pallets coming into the states and such and getting them out there. In fact, I can't. I, I, I this one came from fun again games in oregon so they shipped they, they came in on the west coast and shipped everything out of fun again games okay and is it so that's a all right so they're fulfilling from outside the country or they're i mean they're the publishers yeah the, the yeah they're, they're yeah, well obviously because yeah. i think it's uh I, it's, I think real games is an australian publisher i could be wrong okay i think but i could be wrong everybody yeah. i've seen that is talking about this game like explaining how to play mm -hmm. uh have been people with accents that are not Southern. I'll leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> some, some part of Australia. Yeah, yeah. But I think I, okay. so anyway, but it's, but it's an elegant game. It's, it's one you can play with the family. It's, and it's, and it's fun too, cause it's got that, it's got that vibe of the art is pretty. So that's that wingspan mm -hmm. vibe. Um, it's like, it's like this, I would put it in the same category as wingspan parks, um, obviously Santa Monica, but it, but obviously it doesn't have the complexity of those three games. It's very easy okay. to kind of get into and just, you know, you don't have to, th you can think about it if you're, you're really playing for, for strategy, but at the same time you can just sort of en enjoy yourself, which we did. And it's, you know, 30 to 45 minutes. So it's an easy in and out kind of thing. Cool. And so, yeah, cause I was thinking it sounded a bit like wingspan of flight. If you're like, running your tableau that sounds mm -hmm. you know very i'm running my grasslands i'm doing that yeah i just don't have to gain resources in order to pay for it it's just the uh, cards are there and i get to choose it's my turn it's your turn it's my turn it's your turn and so it's you know it's again it's one of those things where you can tell the game is really built for 
three to four players, but they have yeah. a two player variant and they have a solo mode. And the two player yeah. variant has that adjustment, kind of like the way they adjust um, in between two cities and between the castles, you know, where you have to kind of play these these different things. And even canopies that way, where, you know, there's the, the two player variant, which, you know, can be a struggle because, you know, when it's just you, you and another person, you're learning the game, you kind of master the game, and then you introduce it to somebody else, you're like, oh, wait a minute, these rules I don't know. And yeah. so uh, I don't think this is going to have that same level of complexity, um, but uh, in terms of, of sharing it with other people. And it, with other people, you just get eight rounds instead of four, and you only draft one one ABC card year round. So okay. it, that's that's basically the nuance of it. Um, but anyway, it's a good game. We enjoyed it. Um, you know, it's, it's something that will be a good, like, hey, let's play a game, let, but let's play something quick and something easy. Perfect. And you think the that sort of two player work around worked pretty well? I do, yeah. Because you still got twenty four cards out. Uh the rounds lasted a little longer. You but it but it, you just had to make sure you had two A's, two B's, and two C's from that round and you didn't do A A twice or B B twice or whatever. Right. Um okay. and then the other nuance was um, you know, you have to put your card next to a previous card. Well, in my mind, I'm right. thinking balance, left, right, left, right, left, right. My wife yeah. is over here, like, filling out this way and then filling out. Uh -huh. So you have, you know, different strategies that you can play with. And then they gave you 17 additional scoring tiles. Or, no, there's a total of 17 scoring tiles. So you can okay. change out the different um, win conditions as you get more. And then they have, they gave you 16 boards. So you can have a basic game, and then they have an advanced game that's got some icons on it that as you cover up, you get certain things. And so they give okay. you a level of complexity in the game, but you can just pull it out and play it with, you know, and, and it's, and it's I think it's rated 8 and up, maybe, or okay. 10 and up. They say 10 and up. Um, but even so, I mean, you can play it with a young person with the basic game and, and then kind of pull them forward. So I think it would be a, a good introduction to card drafting game before the kids fall into magic i'm just kidding for all the magic people out there that was a joke that so was the, a joke um, so the so the cards are like general uh, regular poker sized kind of uh, a little smaller think okay. um think the car the the cards you might see in viticulture maybe a little bit larger than those okay those kinds of cards but uh that that kind of size but not as not as small as the original like ticket to ride cards no kind of no no, no okay. nothing like that all right. Well, that sounds kind of nice. Yeah. So you know, so far so good. Um, I, you know, again, with a we backed it on Kickstarter. I I don't know. If, I don't know what their U.S. distribution is going to be like, or if it's going to be in store. I assume it will be. Yeah. Um, but it's been kind of wonky because um, the you know there was a game on kick that wasn't on Kickstarter that I've been waiting for. You know, Parks Wildlife. Oh which, yeah. Um, you know, unfortunately, I mean, it seems like everybody's got it now, but. Damn them. No, no, I just mean that, you know, yeah. you can get it at Atomic, you can get it at, Atomic, LGS, can get yeah. it at uh, Amazon and, and different places, but it still hasn't shown up at my local game store yet because I, I know how this works. The distributors, they're always trying to take care of their different oh, the orders, first, but they, yeah. yeah, but their allocation, I mean, it's been out for a couple of weeks and they're, they're expecting their allocation uh, this week. So, ah, so maybe that'll be something we can talk about next time is Parks oh. Wildlife Expansion. Yeah, and I uh, checked Grow Games is, in fact, from Sydney, so that would track. Uh, okay. And it was reminding me, um, there's a, a, a much older game. This is And this is my role in the podcast, I believe, right? It's to say there's a much older game that reminds me <laughs> uh, called Sans Susie. Yeah, that is that Sans is, yep, yep. And I think oh. we've talked about it. It's a, yeah, and it's a, you're building a garden, the Sans Susie Gardens. Yeah. But it doesn't have, uh, it has different, you're, you're drafting little tiles and you've got cards that'll tell you, you know, either the sort of fixture that you're um, going to pick up, either mm -hmm. like you know trees or fountains or something like that, or the color band that you can pick up. So it's a yeah, so it's got a slightly different, uh, you know, um, approach to drafting there. Right. But and then it also is just building the building the tableau in front of you. There's no firing it off. There's no engine. There's no. I mean, there are points to be had by sending your dude farther and farther down through the through the garden but um that's yeah so I, I i was just thinking both of wingspan and of um sans Susie while you were talking about that so 
that was things that were going on in my head. No, that's awesome. I, I think that that's a that's a neat. Uh, it's it's nice that there's an uh, you know there's a mechanic and there's an homage. Um, that you know, other people kind of bring that mechanic forward in a, in a new way mm-hmm. with a with a new skin on it, if you will. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's and I'm thinking of putting like new skins and stuff. Um, so I've been fascinated by a couple of um, you know, well, not card drafting, uh, deck building games that have a bunch of other stuff going on. So I got Dune Imperium not too long ago, right? And I've been I just played you know. Uh, solo and not the solo mode but just like i like to set down three different players mm. and you know, like hop from chair to chair no just <laughs> i i could see you doing that actually yeah yeah bounce 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 That'd be a nice put on different hats for different ones and yeah you could put that on tiktok yeah ooh, ooh, that's good yeah yeah one of them's drinking beer one of them's drinking wine one of them's drinking whiskey i don't remember a lot about that game i understand <laughs> No, um, but I, I'm thinking about that, and I'm also looking at um, like Lost Ruins of Arnak and a couple of others that have, you know, I'm, or Living Forest is another one that just came out recently, and they all right. have different takes on, you know, pulling cards in, shuffling them up, laying them out, and how you then use what comes up to interact with uh, things on the board in different kind of either worker placement sort of ways or, um, yeah. I love Using Arnak. The cards in different ways. Yeah, we yeah. love we love Arnak. It's a, and I think we've talked about this before, but I, and there, it always bears repeating. What I love about it is there are so many different ways to win that game. Mm-hmm. You don't have to play the same strategy every time to be successful right. at that game. And you know, I'll be out there killing all the monsters, and my wife's just rolling up that track. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and she wins. <laughs> you're like what <laughs> yes well and i think that it also seems to me the kind of game that because of the resources that you pull together and the cards that you get mm-hmm. even though you've only got your two meeples to go out and do stuff with the game continues to expand and it's because of that deck building uh, mechanism pulling new cards in and and deciding what you're going to do and, and you know it looks like you know if you've got it, it can it'll be very different depending on which cards show up in which order, um, like wingspan or other sort of engine builders of that ilk. Right. No, Although that makes it's sense. not really. You know, but yes. Now, so we talked about what was on my table. What's is there anything interesting been on your table in the last few weeks since we were well, last together? Yeah. So playing the Dune game mm-hmm. um, was an awful lot of fun. I really like the way that that game also gives you a lot of mechanisms for getting for you know. Uh, dropping your original hand of kind of low powered cards and replacing them and those sort of similarly there's a bunch of different things you can do on a turn but there's really you only have the a couple of meeples to set out and to use to do stuff sure um and i like the way that it both feels like there's only one thing you can do Hmm. you know you put a little dude out that's all but that opens up so many different things that you can do at the same time so i was really enjoying that and just the kind of way I know that if you're super into the lore of um, of Dune, there are parts of this that don't necessarily make sense to you. But I am not enough into the lore of <laughs> Dune that it really bothers me in the least. So I'm okay with that. Um, well, I, I stopped with the first book. Yeah, but I've read that first book a number of times. So I think I, I've read two or three of them, and then but that was so long ago. Yeah. Um, it was so long enough ago that I remember you having hair when I was reading them. Wow. So that's, I know. That'll set you back. I think I had hair when I read them. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. yeah. I um, know I did well, and, the first time I read it. <laughs> and so there was, uh, yeah. Um, so I was enjoying going through the, the, the rules. And it's really, you know, there, it, there's not... It's, a, it's another one that doesn't have a whole lot of rules overhead, but a lot of complexity comes from how those cards come together, what kind of combos you can pull off, and those things happening. But the one that uh, Laura and I have been able to play um, just recently was uh, Savannah Park. Do you know this one? I don't know that one. So it is, I want to say, not too long ago. That's a 2021 game, yep. yep. Uh, with uh, Kiesling and Kramer, the Wonder Twins. Yeah. And it's, it's one of those, um, so everybody has, I think it's 31 individual tiles 
uh, and you randomly put them onto a sort of hexagonal hexagonal tiles on a hexagonal shaped board, um, and you are sort of administering this park for people in the savannah. So it's yeah, no, I'm looking at it right now. It looks beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it's and it's it is, but each of those tiles um, has a unique set of animals on it as well, and on each turn the active player picks up one of them and says you know uh the one with three ibexes i think they're supposed to be antelopes but laura and i keep calling them ibexes the one with three <laughs> ibexes um and so everybody finds the one with the three ibexes and they flip it over so it's now the colorful side like your player color side right, right and you put it anywhere you want to in your park with some you know some rule placement stuff right you know, can't put it on fire that kind of thing um and the game just goes until you've essentially flipped all of your tiles. And it very quickly becomes clear that this is a, a it's not as brutal a uh, puzzle as say Calico. Yeah. Um, because yeah, but it has that kind of feel to it. Cause all of a sudden you're like, okay, so you're going to score eventually based on the largest grouping of animals multiplied by the number of water holes in that group. Yeah, no, it's a it's a beautiful. I mean, I'm looking at it right now, and it's yeah. uh, wow. That and that's you know, it kind of remind. It's it's almost like you have the scoreboard and the different tableaus just the same way you do in the gardens, but at the mm. same time, it almost reminds me a little bit of um, Ark Nova. Okay, I think Ma maybe much a simple weight. version of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, yeah. I mean, I mean, it would be if you didn't want the weight, it would probably be a good <laughs> alternative. And, and it's and, and it's it's super easy to just say, you know, that's it. That you pick up a tile, you announce it to everybody else. Everybody else picks up the same tile and puts it, you know, down somewhere. And then there are um, a couple of rules about what's going to score around these groups of fires and how many trees or grasses you can see. Um, and otherwise, it's those sets. I know all together hmm. uh, and it becomes you start to think okay so all right i need to move this rhino to there then bring this elephant over here but to move the elephant there i have to make sure that the ostriches are gone and then the person you're playing with decides to move the lions or whatever and you're like ah, oh, damn it okay wait i didn't plan for that one <laughs> and so it's it's both super you know accessible very quick to get to the table very quick to sort of get your mind around what the rules are, but man, just a fantastic puzzle in there. Yeah, I'm gonna have to pick this up, I think, because uh, interestingly enough, uh, we're going to the beach in a few weeks and we're ah. gonna take some youngsters with us, and I think this would be a nice game to have at the beach. How young are these youngsters that we're uh, talking about? 10 and up. 10 oh, and yeah. 12. Yeah. 10 to 12. It was the yeah. one, one of them, one of them we gave. Uh, please disregard earlier comment. One of them we gave magic cards at Christmas time, um, and the local owner of the game store had given me some extra cards to make it a complete set for him. Nice. And then we gave um, the girl uh, Sunday s split. Oh the, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so we're gonna play those, and and I'm thinking like, uh, well, I want to take Betrayal to the to the beach, but I'll probably have to take the Scooby Doo version. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Have you played uh, Keyforge or played that with this kid? I have not. Because that's one where you you just have you know they give you a unique deck and a way. No, no. I, I I if yeah. if you were to look up into this shelf ah, right here, okay. I have maybe uh, eighteen or so Keyforge decks, and I have the keys and I have the mats and nice. Uh, my OCD uh, kicked in when I found Keyforge, and then now nobody plays it. <laughs> Yeah, but I, would think, I mean, I, I picked up a, a set and a couple of extra decks uh, when Sky was like, I think I want to play Magic. I'm like, let's not dive that <laughs> deeply into the pool. Let's see how you do with a head to head battler and yeah. see how that works. And Sky was like, yeah, kind of take it or leave it. I'm like, good. Okay, fair enough. Then we will not be exploring. And uh, there were together. some people at the game store that uh, when when Keyforge was big, I mean, uh, there were a couple of players that went down to Atlanta for a competition and got wow. into like the final three. Uh, it was amazing to watch those folks play. Um, That's cool. And this was all before COVID. And of course, 
you know, there has been that, that post COVID diaspora, if you will, of people that are, you know, kind of had moved on and they haven't mm -hmm. come back to the game store yet. So, well, and, and Keyforge itself kind of went out of print very briefly and yep. they're bringing it back Garfield sort of under his own auspices. It sounds like, well, we're good. Uh, well, I have a bunch, maybe one day they'll be collectible and worth something. Cause I got a whole boatload of it. <laughs> Well, they're re, they're re, so he's kickstarting a whole new version of it and yeah. all of that. Apparently, yeah. and I found this curious, uh, part of their sort of statement was that uh, the software went away. Like the somehow they lost it, like the software that they needed to um, generate the decks randomly. And I was like, this is not like keys I need to use the keys but yeah yeah hmm. like, i don't know i just left that, them somewhere oh my god they're probably still at the cafe you know, that I don't might know. be uh hmm. i know yeah okay i was like hmm this is this is apparently the lawyers got together and decided that this is the narrative we're going to tell <laughs> but they had to um but they did have to recreate it from the ground up and i'm wow. guessing that whoever owned the so whoever far. owned it said yeah you're not getting that back yeah. you can make it again interesting yeah, yeah. Okay. Always, always make sure your contracts uh, really tight when you're dealing with IP, and which is interesting because it's a, it's a, it's a nice segue into a topic that I wanted to talk about today. All right, man, let's do it. Um, the, and we usually don't talk about technology on this show except for uh, the fact that we always talk about my struggles in getting the microphone to work <laughs> or something like that. That's that's about as far as we go, but. Um, there's one thing that caught my has caught my attention over the last couple of weeks, and um, there is an organization called Patreon. Oh yeah. So Patreon supports is, is allows a lot of artists to monetize their content mm -hmm. in a way that uh, doesn't rely on the number of hits that you get from Google or, or um, YouTube or what have you. And although it's primarily a medium for like podcasters, I know a lot of podcasters mm -hmm. have have Patreons. Um, it's also um, a platform for RPG content creators. So DM Dave, if you want to subscribe to DM Dave's um, work and get the broadsword and everything, you're doing it through Patreon. I don't think he's got another option at this time. Um, Devin Rue, who is the cartographer that does all these beautiful maps for like Critical Role and Wizards okay. of the Coast, and she did the the Beetle and Grim um, Curse of Strahd maps of the castle and everything. I mean, she's okay. an amazing artist. Well, anyway, so Patreon Jack Conti, uh, who's also known for the band Pomplemousse. If you've ever seen oh, the yes. Pomplemousse videos, he and his wife do the Pomplemousse videos, and and he's a smart guy. But about two weeks ago, they laid off their security team, oh. which was a red flag. This and is this is Patreon. Who this did is this? Patreon, yeah. And mm. now they have laid off seventy seventeen percent of its workforce, and are closing offices. And it's just oh. it's a concern because now if you're a, a creator, like so, um, I don't I don't know Devin Rue. But I know Devin Rue, and the way I know Devin Rue is because I'm a Patreon of hers, and I've been going back and forth with her on Discord trying to figure out how I can support her but not support her on Patreon anymore. Ah, uh, okay. And so she and I, and then there were some, there was a bug in the system, and I was helping um, them overcome that bug last night. So this is why it's kind of fresh in my mind. And so oh, sure. I, I'm just kind of surfacing this. For, you know, I'm not going to make any judgments on Jack Conti and, and Patreon. You know, companies, sometimes they overreach and then they stall and they fall and all this stuff. But when you take, you know, if you're a content creator and you're relying on a, your part of your income to come through this vehicle, uh, security is kind of important. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm hoping that there will be something that will fill in the gap because, you know, everybody takes their, you know, their percentage. You know, mm -hmm. a publisher takes a percentage. Um, and, um, you know, platforms like Patreon are going to take their percentage and all this thing. So I'm hoping that there will be a way that, that content creators, whether it's board games or, um, or what have you, um, 
will be able to to monetize their content in a way because they don't have access to the the massive distribution pieces. So, just kind of wanted to bring that up because I I do I do there are, I I only sponsor have only sponsored three people on Patreon. Okay. Uh, DM Dave because I get a lot of good content from DM Dave. DM Dave I use his stuff mm-hmm. um, a lot. Uh, maybe not his one offs, but his characters. Uh, he was the first one where he had he had put together this really nice actual uh, Cthulhu stats. Oh wow! So in my last campaign, instead of just throwing a mind flare, I was able to throw Cthulhu into the mix, Ooh. which was which was very entertaining for me. I'll bet. <laughs> but um, anyway. So I digress, and then I, I then I and I obviously Devin Rue because I, I I'm just a big fan of her work, and and if you at the right subscription level you can get access to her maps and use them in virtual tabletops, and if like in our oh, nice. campaign, if I had a map of hers, the content for we're already kind of using some maps for for Curse of Strahd, but um, if I had her content, I would be able to use that because I'm a subscriber in the right way and I and then we could show it on our channel and it wouldn't be a an IP issue cuz I asked nice. her I asked her directly hey if I use this online is it a problem so um, anyway uh, I, I just kind of throw that out there because it's mm-hmm. one of the you know Patreon has been one of those things I've you know on the one hand I'm I've been a big fan of Jack and what he's done with Patreon and I like the way that he and his wife do the music but now they're they're running into trouble so I'm hoping um, that it's just that, and there's not more to the story. I think there's, there's. I've read another article that there might be some other issues that have nothing to do with board games, so I won't talk about it here. But anyway, I'll leave that to to y'all's individual uh, research, uh, so to speak. Hmm. But anyway, uh, I just thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, that is interesting, and I I know a lot of yeah a lot of content creators who do go through Patreon and mm-hmm. are you know ways if you you know. Uh, subscribe at certain tiers you get certain you either get the content early or you get personal you know massages from the creators or maybe not massages but uh you know con- contact that kind of stuff uh and it felt like a really nice way to very consistently support people whose work you uh valued and not having to put them through the the hoops of like a kickstarter like, okay, it's season five, let's do our season five Kickstarter. And then, you know, instead it's just, uh, yeah, no, you can just sign up and we'll, you know, hit us up with as much as, you know, as much or as little as you want. And yeah. And I know that these and, organizations get to take their little cut, but I, I like the ones sure. that can, can give the money, the majority of the money to the, to the, the creator as, as best as possible, because it's kind of like when I'm in a, a local business, I have, uh, I will much rather use my debit card than a credit card if I'm in a small business because I know it's less expensive for them to do the the debit transaction than a credit card transaction. And when if they have to pay seven percent to a credit right. card company, that that that's a big deal, you know. It is, and I the thing that I also like about Patreon. I mean, yeah, they're going to take their their slice as it as mm. the you know as it goes past, but um, it's still it feels to me like a really great service for creators again, so that you don't have to do the whole big Kickstarter again and again and again, you can just say, Hey, you know, subscribe. And then once a month, I just get this little chunk of cash. And if there's a bunch of you, I mean, and this is kind of the whole idea of, of crowdfunding to begin with, Mm -hmm. right. Is um, I, if I ask, you know, 5,000 people for five bucks, that's going to be a whole lot easier than trying to get $25,000 in one chunk from one person. Right. right. And so, so I, you know, I it would be sad to see them go. It doesn't like when you start hearing that they're cutting different chunks of the workforce and then a fairly decent percentage of them that, that creates worry in my mind. Yeah. Well, one of the other, the, the third people, the third organization that I support on, um, Patreon is the Grumpy Old Geeks, and they're a completely hmm. different podcast. But they have a they have a broad segment on it this in this week's episode um, that kind of gets into the rest of that. I haven't had a chance to listen to it yet, but I did pull the articles today because I wanted to talk about this because of the interaction I had had with Devin D E V E N. By the way, Devin Rue D E V E N R U E. For those of you who want to check her out and her work, um, DevinRue.com. 
it's an amazing uh, site. And, and if you subscribe at the right level, you can actually go and participate in her cartography classes where she helps you with world building and, oh, and that's teaches cool. you techniques. I'm not quite that subscriber level because I just, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have that kind of time. Because sure. it's, it's sure. interesting. Cause that's, that's another segue because I was in the game store yesterday and I, I finally decided I have, let's see, I already talked about this one. And here I have a bunch of minis that I really need to paint uh, because I'm not, I haven't really done that. And I think that that is something that I should start doing. So I was in there talking to some people that kind of come in every other Saturday okay, and to paint minis to paint minis. And, um, so that was kind of interesting because that's where I met Christina styles, uh, right. who is a, is a publisher of, uh, some, uh, RPGs uh, that you would find some Pathfinder content as well as some other content that you can find on Amazon and uh, on RPG Drive Through and uh, that's all I'm going to say about her because it was a really interesting conversation watching her paint and talking about stuff and realizing that she's somebody we need to have on the show yes, so awesome. we're going to try to have her on uh, in the next uh, the next few weeks but. Um, but first, uh, she let me know about, they were all talking about Mace, what Mace Con, right. which is this uh, thing. That I, and they were looking at me like, because I, I was like a deer in the headlight about it. Because, you know, uh, I've learned more about gaming during the pandemic than before. So it wasn't something that was on my radar. And so evidently, Mace Con is the big um, game, board game and RPG um, in Charlotte that will be happening in November. But unfortunately the person who, who, uh, was the responsible for it, um, passed away. And so, um, and his name was Jeff Smith. And so this year the tabletop gaming convention will be held in his remembrance and they're going to call it Jeff con 2022. So November 11th through the 13th at the Hilton Charlotte university place. Um, so, and there are some people from our local game store that are going to be taking this forward in some fashion. And we hope to have um, that individual on in two weeks' time uh, to sort of talk about that. So a little teaser about that. But if you check out uh, justusproductions.com, uh, you can kind of see what's going to happen. Because from what I understand, let me look at the calendar here, on the 26th of this month, They'll open up the games. So if you want to play at a game, maybe run a game, uh, that's coming up. So I want to take a look at that to see if there is, um, you know, something that could, you know, play a game or run a game or participate or sure. something. Uh, and that's going to be that's in Charlotte. In Charlotte, Hilton. Robert. Yeah, Hilton. Okay. Well, it's it's the Hilton Charlotte University place. So if you're coming from where you live, you would go all the way up 85 past the middle of downtown Charlotte. And you okay. get off at the university exit, Harris Road, okay. and uh, it's it's right there. Um, there's a big complex built around it that's been there for a long time, and there's a light rail station there you can get to as well. You don't have to even drive and park if you don't want to. Uh, but that Hilton is has been pretty much the go to for cons uh, in okay. Charlotte um, for the smaller cons, yeah. So nice. Anyway, I wanted to to bring that up. Um, what about you, Any? I, I have a couple of other topics, but I don't want to keep you know stealing the, the thunder here. What, you got anything going on? Um, not really. I mean, you were talking about painting minis, and mm -hmm. one of my uh, students is is writing about uh, Warhammer 40K as his uh, his his game that he's talking about, and he's got his minis. He, he said he first came to school and left his minis at home, but then went back. I think over Labor Day weekend <laughs> and and picked up a bunch of his Warhammer stuff and has been painting his Warhammer armies. That's so we had a nice and we had a nice long conversation about um, about the nature of Warhammer. So that was you know, I, I love this class because um, I know a fair bit about tabletop gaming, but there's vast, vast wilderness of knowledge out there of which I know nothing. And so it's always fun when my students discover things and they're like, hey, did you know this about you know, let's talk about Warhammer. Okay, let's talk about Warhammer. Not stuff I expected to do. It's yeah, nice. I, I, t I think I told you that I took my daughter into the game store and they were doing this big Warhammer meetup that they do like once a month. And there were just all these people around the table. And she was fascinated with it and loved the mechanics. Oh, yeah. and the, I, mean, I don't know if, you know, 
I don't know if she cared about the game, but she liked the aesthetic of it. Mm -hmm. No, it's a super fascinating and bizarre world. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's kind of fun. Um, and it kind of began life apparently as a satire, but some of the satire seems to have um, sort of been scrubbed off mostly inadvertently. I think they still might think of it that way, but there's a whole lot of interesting um, just visuals to go along with this whole thing. Very, yeah. Just a whole lot to uh, think about there. No, it's, uh, it, it is. I mean, and it's interesting to see you know, the el evolution, if you will, of, mm -hmm. you know, people when they get into different games, because, you know, it's, it's, you know, we've, I've, I've joked a long time about, you know, like, oh, I'll never play Catan. It's the monopoly of the mainstream board <laughs> game. You know, I'm sure the minute I sat down and played it, I'd be like, wow, this is great. We should do this all more often. It's pretty you know? good. Yeah, no, it's a solid um, game. Yeah. But I mean, but there's the same thing. I mean, I make fun of, you know, the whole magic thing because it's just like, it's not something I want to invest my time in. But the people mm -hmm. that do, man, they they, they, they love it. Um, and, and they can talk about it with um, extraordinary detail. Yeah, no, so 100%. So find that amazing. Um, and it was just, you know, but there's also like, um, that one of my students is writing about Uno. Yeah. I'm like, what is there to learn about Uno? There's a lot. He, um, He's like, here's the thing. Uno looks like it's this family game. It's this kid's game. And, but I know people from like late junior high, high school, college, early adulthood. That's where you really get into Uno. And I know people who bet on Uno games. Like they play for money. It's like, well, that's, that is surprising. Yeah. <laughs> I did not imagine that people would be playing Uno for money, but they do. So. You know, it's funny. I, I one of one of my friends growing up, his his family. I, I learned to play Uno at their house and learned mm -hmm. to love Uno at their house. And that was probably, you know, you know, an era when you'd play Uno or we'd go to the beach and play Kings in the Corner and mm -hmm. you know yep. different games that you could kind of get into and was accessible to a lot of different players. I think we spent one summer at the beach. That's all we played was Uno. Kings in the Corner and Uno. Oh, Kings yeah. in the Corner. Yeah. yeah, well, both of them really. Yep. So. Yeah, but it's interesting because, you know, Charlotte's got a very uh, diverse uh, magic community. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, um, one of the one of the stores, there's a store in Charlotte called Get Some Game. Okay. Uh, and the owner, uh, Leon Fortner, uh, passed away uh, a few weeks ago. Um, he was actually, unfortunately, he was run down in a parking lot after a little altercation over a parking space. Oh my God! Yeah, welcome to our world, right, morons? Yeah. Um, but anyway, and it's just really rippled through that community because all the friendly local game store owners know each other, all sure. the people in the magic community know each other. Uh, it's actually the store I was in that inspired me to get back into RPG because I was ah. uh, one of the Eagle Scouts that I had worked with a long time ago. I was doing an art exhibit at get some game cool and we were in there looking at his work this was november 2018 okay october november 2018 and i saw the dice and i was like you know what i need to get back into this <laughs> and the so although me. i never really spent a lot of time at get some game it was the it was the catalyst that got me to head down this path and so it's just been i i it wasn't something I'd planned to talk about, but as we kind of got into the the, the 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 magic thing, I wanted to bring it up because I mean Leon Leon sure. Fortner was you know pretty well known. He's been on a couple of you know um, podcasts and stuff, and so it's uh, mm -hmm. just you know get some game in Charlotte. So, mm. um, so I, I have two other things, but I don't want to. Okay, man. Lay it on us. What do you got? Well, first of all, I was just going to say I, I'm back to another Kickstarter. <clears throat> uh, okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, Lying Pirates: The Race for the Pirate Throne. It's a dice game. Lying Pirates. Yeah, okay. But I've been I, I like the idea of a pirate themed game. <laughs> so Lying right, then. Pirates, and I and I backed it, and I had to back it, and like, what was the currency? I backed it, and it was like S E K. It's like it's from Sweden. Okay. Yeah. Um, awesome, but it's um, it's the they say it's the wildest dice game of the century, and uh, it's twelve and up. It's ten to fifteen minutes per player. 
Uh, okay. It's two to four, but if you back the right level of the Kickstarter, there's a t- there you can do up to six people. All right. And the aesthetic on it looks really cool, and all the all the it's it's like all the they're blowing through all the the stretch goals. So there's going to be a lot of content in this thing. And what's so, that one called again? Li- the li- li- Lying Pirates: The Race Lying for the Pirate Pirates. Throne. L Y I N G okay. Pirates. Yeah. Uh, it's from Stockholm, Sweden. And it is supposed, it's got 11 days left, so check it out. Mm -hmm. Um, So, and then I'm trying to find when it's supposed to deliver, allegedly, within reason. Yeah, well. You know, you know, all those things. Uh, June 2023, Mm -hmm. anywhere in the world. So we'll probably have it next next September. Okay. (laughs) So. Yeah. So I was just going to mention that because it was one that I have back since the last time cool. we talked. Yeah, but it's okay. a, like I said, it's a really nice aesthetic. And then the last thing um, that I wanted to kind of bring up, not that I'm foreshadowing in any way, shape, or form, but um, I don't know how closely you follow Critical Role. I don't. Okay. Well, spoiler alert. Um, okay, I'm they're, alerted. They're in episode, they're in uh, campaign three. They're right. in the 30s of their episode number. Okay. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, two of the player characters died. I mean, yeah. like, like no death saves, you're dead. And the third was about to die. And, wow. And now there's been some... Because you know how things work in D and D, sure. You know there are there are ways, you know, revivify and and others, that some of them, from what I understand, are no longer dead, but one is absolutely gone. And wow. so there's been a lot of so there's been a lot of chatter about that and like YouTube and stuff like that. But it but there was one person, and this is really where I'm going with this, hmm. that 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 brought up you know. Matt Mercer is willing to kill player player characters, and so should you, uh. because it's just the 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 dynamic of the game. And it was, I mean, not not like he wasn't like oh, I'm going to murder hobo everybody into a TBK, <laughs> TPK, but it was the story took them there, and the dice took them there, and right. he played the character that he was playing the way that they would play it. You know, if somebody's down, they're like, okay, you're down. With death saves, saves, I'm going to go get these people. No, they were like, ur, 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 you know, and it was just playing the character. And it was just, it's just a, a very interesting thing because I think in the RPGs, you know, there's obviously if you're out as a character, you can always come back with a different character and you can, you right. know, roll your way in. It's just kind of interesting um, to just sort of see how much the hubbub has been about it because that happened in campaign two mm-hmm. with one of their other players that I think was more of an accidental kind of thing. Um, but anyway, it was just, it's just been kind of an interesting huh. thing that kind of brings into the, the dynamic of the game. And it's going to be really curious to see how it goes and how it evolves. Anyway, yeah. I don't know. Just thought I'd throw that out on the table. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, and, um, since we've talked about, uh, Christina Stiles, I'd be interested to hear her take on these kinds of things and yeah. some of the work that she does around that. Yeah. So I think, uh, um, you know, as we kind of move into the the seasons here, I, th- I think we're going to have a few more guests than just you and I talking about this kind yeah. of stuff. And I think you're right; it would be really useful to get some of their perspectives on this. So, so yeah. So if we're if we do this right, if we plan this right, in the the coming weeks, we will hear from you know uh, an avid board game enthusiast who's going to be really leading us into uh, a new era of cons in the South. Mm-hmm. which I think will be really interesting to see how that's going to go and, and, and maybe how we can uh, help with that. Uh, and then talking to somebody who's been a content creator and publisher and sort of some of the nuances with that. And then if we do this right, we hope to have um, somebody who's actually written a book on how RPGs is effective in clinical psychology. So right. it could be pretty interesting um, over the next couple of weeks. So we hope you will come back and um, give us a listen. Yeah, but that's all I got this week. I don't okay. know what else you have. I don't want to close the door on you. Nope, nope. That's. I mean, I'm waiting for a Kickstarter to fulfill and get shipped. Uh, it's, I mean, it's done, but it's just like they're kind of in shipping mode right now. Yeah. So yep. Hopefully, seeing that in the next uh, couple of weeks or so. 
Cool. Um, I'll talk more about that when it shows up. Yeah, and we'll, we, we're still slowly but surely trying to get things off the shelf of shame. Yes. Or shelf of opportunity. Shelf of opportunity. Wanna... Well, I, I will tell you this. I, I did create some efficiency in my storage. So I've been storing ah. all my games like this. Mm-hmm. And I was running out of space, and then I took a page out of Rodney Smith's book because you know every time he's standing in front of all of his games and he's flipping that empty box upside down oh, yeah. that we all think is full, all of his games are stacked like this. So I went back through and I restacked my games like this, and horizontally, um, yeah. And I got a heck of a lot more space. Oh, excellent! So I Ooh. freed up a couple of cubbies, and that just means more games. There you go. Always, always. <laughs> All right, James. Well, until next time, it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure, Joe. Yeah. Um, I'm Joe Mahaffey. I'm not bored. I'm board gaming. And I'm James Engelhart, hoping that all your tiebreakers break your way. All right. See you next time, everybody. Bye. Bye.